Okay, welcome back. So let's look at an example of applying these two independent sample means ideas. Okay, so we've got, so say we, we've got two schools that we're looking at, and each school is going to test out a, a new curriculum. All right, so we have, call them East High School and West High School. Right, they have one class do one curriculum, one class do another curriculum, and we want to compare. Now whenever we have two samples of data, we first got to think in our mind, okay, should I treat these as matched pairs or should I treat them as independent samples? Well here, we've got students from two different schools. There's no real way to match them up on a one-to-one -one basis. And also notice our sample sizes are different. So even if I did want to match them up, there'd still be two students from West High School that I couldn't match up with anybody. So that'll be kind of a giveaway lots of times. Um, if I have two different sample sizes, most of the time that's that's not going to be matched pairs. All right, so we, we want to treat these as independent samples. So let's state our hypotheses. All right, we're not really sure which curriculum is going to do better or which school's going to do better. Okay, so, but remember our null will have to say okay if we're trying to show there's a difference we assume there is no difference we don't know what that difference is going to be so we probably go with a two-tailed test here all right my null is that school one equal to school two my alternative here go with a two-tailed test and let's just use alpha 0.05 all right just on a side note here it doesn't really matter who we call group one and who we call group two, whether it's East High School, West High School, it doesn't matter as long as I stay consistent throughout my test. Right? And, and it especially doesn't matter here because we have a two-tailed test. Now, we gotta be careful and we gotta stay consistent if you wanna go left-tailed or right-tailed. Okay, so remember we have to check our assumptions for both groups. So we're gonna check these visually using our, our simple graphs. All right, my first group, this is East High School. Um, I mean, it doesn't look perfectly normal, but we don't see extreme skewness. Again, West High School, not great, but we don't see anything extreme that really concerns us, and, and we don't see outliers on our box plots comparing the two. Okay, so I think we're in good shape to use our t-distribution. So next, let's calculate our test statistic. All right, so using our sample data, plugging into our formula there we go now notice a couple things about when we're plugging in to our formula here okay the question here in this problem the data that we're given we're given notice this says s our sample standard deviation so I need to make sure that I notice my formula calls for variances here squared alright so I could go so 8.78 was my standard deviation at East High School. I, got, I put it in here, but I got a square. All right? And remember when I said stay consistent with who you call group one and group two. All right? That's This is where that really matters. Because I'm taking the standard deviation or the variance here and dividing by its specific sample size 24. All right? So I got to keep these consistent. And I also got to stay consistent in my numerator so that I come up with the correct sign. Here we have a test statistic of positive 2.437. Okay, so next step, critical value. All right, so the, we, we know we're using the t-distribution, so the things that we'll need to go into it are alpha, the type of test that we have, and our degrees of freedom. All right, now here I'm going to use a con, what we called a conservative estimate of our degrees of freedom. All right, in 1 is 24, in 2 is 26, I'm going to use the minimum of the two as my degrees of freedom there, 23. Alpha was 0.05. It's a two-tailed test. All right, so that means I'm going to need to divide alpha by two when I look that up in the table. All right, so let's take a look at that in the table. So my degrees of freedom, I'm working with 23 here. And alpha was 0.05, two-tailed test. I'm dividing by two, so I'm going to be in this 0.025 column. All right, so wherever 23 and 0.025 connect there, so our table value or critical value there is 2.069.
all right or you could graph it you could use your Excel T inverse function or, or graph it and, and whatever all right next step PVAP all right since this is a two-tailed test we know we're gonna need two times the area and since it's the T table let's go with the area to the right of that positive test statistic all right so Again, the key two-tailed, we got to multiply by two. Now, two-tailed, estimating two-tailed p-values with the t gets a little bit tricky. All right, remember our degrees of freedom is 23. So let's look at our table. All right, so we're in this 23 degrees of freedom row. Okay, my test statistic is 2.437. So we want the area to the right of 2.437. So 2.437 is somewhere between these two numbers. Probably pretty close to this one. All right, but the area to the right of 2.437 is between 0.01 and 0.025. All right, that's great, except this is a two-tailed test. Okay, so I've estimated it with a range between 0.01 and 0.025, but since this is a two-tailed test, if I want to estimate this p-value, I got to remember to multiply by 2. Okay, so that's where when we have a two-tailed test, estimating p-values can be a little bit tricky. Not bad, but just got to think a little bit. All right, now of course we can always use technology to find an exact p-value. Our exact p-value is this. You could find it in Excel. 2 times your t dist. And I, I use t dist right tailed here. Um, so 2 times that, or graph it in mini tab, the area to the right of that, but then you still, you got to remember, okay, here we go. I've got the area to the right of this, but got to multiply by 2 because it's 2 tail. All right, so let's frame everything back in the context of our question. So our test statistic was in our rejection region. Our p-value was less than our less than alpha. Okay, so we do see a statistically significant difference here. All right, what does that mean? It means there's a difference in the curriculum. All right, what exactly is that difference though? We're not sure. Because remember we just did a two-tailed test. So there is a difference. All right, let's estimate that difference with a confidence interval. Okay, so here is our data again. Let's just say 95% confidence interval. All right, so our, our sample looked like that. Degrees of freedom, we've been using the conservative estimate. That's 23. Remember our formula. Plug in, do the math. Again, our, getting your test statistic, or your, uh, sorry, your critical value is really the only, only tricky part there. All right, so we notice we're estimating a positive difference here. All right, so what would a positive difference indicate? So remember, we were using east minus west. Okay, so a positive difference would indicate that these values for east are bigger than the value of west. Now it's either pretty big interval here, but it's either slightly positive or about 10 points more positive. That's what we're estimating this difference as. Okay, so by estimating this difference like this, we know there is a difference, and it's probably that East High School is doing a little bit better than West High School. Right? How do we interpret it? Again, 95% 95% confident the interval we created captured the parameter we were looking for. All right. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.